character by samuel smiles part five b martin luther was not called upon to lay down his life for his faith but from the day that he declared himself against the pope he daily ran the risk of losing it at the beginning of his great struggle he stood almost entirely alone the odds against him were tremendous on one side said he himself are learning genius numbers grandeur rank power sanctity miracles on the other wycliffe lorenzo valla augustine and luther a poor creature a man of yesterday standing well nigh alone with a few friends summoned by the emperor to appear at worms to answer the charge made against him of hearsay he determined to answer in person those about him told him that he would lose his life if he went and they urged him to fly no he said i will repair thither though i should find there thrice as many devils as there are tiles upon the housetops warned against the bitter enmity of a certain duke george he said i will go there though for nine whole days running it rain duke george's luther was as good as his word and he set forth upon his perilous journey when he came in sight of the old bell towers of worms he stood up in his chariot and sang ein fest berg ist uners so Gott, the marseilles of the reformation the words and music of which he is said to have improvised only two days before shortly before the meeting of the diet an old soldier george frenchberg put his hand upon luther's shoulder and said to him good monk good monk take heed what thou doest thou art going into a harder fight than any of us have ever yet been in but luther's only answer to the veteran was that he had determined to stand upon the bible and his conscience luther's courageous defence before the diet is on record and forms one of the most glorious pages in history when finally urged by the emperor to retract he said firmly sire unless i am convinced of my error by the testimony of scripture or by manifest evidence i cannot and will not retract for we must never act contrary to our conscience such is my profession of faith and you must expect none other from me higher stai eek eek con nike anders got health mer fourteen here stand i i cannot do otherwise god help me he had to do his duty to obey the orders of a power higher than that of kings and he did it at all hazards afterwards when hard pressed by his enemies at augsburg luther said that if he had five hundred heads he would lose them all rather than recant his article concerning faith like all courageous men his strength only seemed to grow in proportion to the difficulties he had to encounter and overcome there is no man in germany said hutton who more utterly despises death than does luther and to his moral courage perhaps more than to that of any other single man do we owe the liberation of modern thought and the vindication of the great rights of the human understanding the honorable and brave man does not fear death compared with ignominy it is said of the royalist earl of strafford that as he walked to the scaffold on tower hill his step and manner were those of a general marching at the head of an army to secure victory rather than of a condemned man to undergo sentence of death so the commonwealth's man sir john eliot went alike bravely to his death on the same spot saying ten thousand deaths rather than defile my conscience the chastity and purity of which i value beyond all this world eliot's greatest tribulation was on account of his wife whom he had to leave behind when he saw her looking down upon him from the tower window he stood up in the cart waved his hat and cried to heaven my love to heaven and leave you in the storm as he went on his way one in the crowd called out that is the most glorious seat you ever sat on to which he replied it is so indeed and rejoiced exceedingly although success is the guerdon for which all men toil they have nevertheless often to labor unperseveringly without any glimmer of success in sight they have to live meanwhile upon their courage sowing their seed it may be in the dark in the hope that it will yet take root and spring up in achieved result 
the best of causes have had to fight their way to triumph through a long succession of failures and many of the assailants have died in the breach before the fortress has been won the heroism they have displayed is to be measured not so much by their immediate success as by the opposition they have encountered and the courage with which they have maintained the struggle the patriot who fights in always losing battle the martyr who goes to death amidst the triumphant shouts of his enemies the discoverer like columbus whose heart remains undaunted through the bitter years of his long wandering woe are examples of the moral sublime which excite a profounder interest in the hearts of men than even the most complete and conspicuous success by the side of such instances as these how small by comparison seem the greatest deeds of valor inciting men to rush upon death and die amidst the frenzied excitement of physical warfare but the greater part of the courage that is needed in the world is not of a heroic kind courage may be displayed in everyday life as well as in historic fields of action there needs for example the common courage to be honest the courage to resist temptation the courage to speak the truth the courage to be what we really are and not to pretend to be what we are not the courage to live honestly within our own means and not dishonestly upon the means of others a great deal of the unhappiness and much of the vice of the world is owing to weakness and indecision of purpose in other words to lack of courage men may know what is right and yet fail to exercise the courage to do it they may understand the duty they have to do but will not summon up the requisite resolution to perform it the weak and undisciplined man is at the mercy of every temptation he cannot say no but falls before it and if his companionship be bad he will be all the easier led away by bad example into wrongdoing nothing can be more certain than that the character can only be sustained and strengthened by its own energetic action the will which is the central force of character must be trained to habits of decision otherwise it will neither be able to resist evil nor to follow good decision gives the power of standing firmly when to yield however slightly might be only the first step in a downhill course to ruin calling upon others for help in forming a decision is worse than useless a man must so train his habits as to rely upon his own powers and depend upon his own courage in moments of emergency plutarch tells of a king of macedon who in the midst of an action withdrew into the adjoining town under pretense of sacrificing to hercules whilst his opponent emilius at the same time that he implored the divine aid sought for victory sword in hand and won the battle and so it ever is in the actions of daily life many are the valiant purposes formed and that end merely in words deeds intended that are never done designs projected that are never begun and all for want of a little courageous decision better far the silent tongue but the eloquent deed for in life and in business dispatch is better than discourse and the shortest answer of all is doing in matters of great concern and which must be done says tillotson there is no surer argument of a weak mind than irresolution to be undetermined when the case is so plain and the necessity so urgent to be always intending to live a new life but never to find time to set about it this is as if a man should put off eating and drinking and sleeping from one day to another until he is starved and destroyed there needs also the exercise of no small degree of moral courage to resist the corrupting influences of what is called society although mrs grundy may be a very vulgar and commonplace personage her influence is nevertheless prodigious most men but especially women are the moral slaves of the class of caste to which they belong there is a sort of unconscious conspiracy existing amongst them against each other's individuality each circle and section each rank and class has its respective customs and observances to which conformity is required at the risk of being tabooed some are immured within a bastille of fashion others of custom others of opinion and few are there who have the courage to think outside their sect to act outside their party and to step out into the free air of individual thought and action we dress and eat and follow fashion 
though it may be at the risk of debt ruin and misery living not so much according to our means as according to the superstitious observances of our class though we may speak contemptuously of the indians who flatten their heads and of the chinese who cramp their toes we have only to look at the deformities of fashion amongst ourselves to see that the reign of mrs grundy is universal but moral cowardice is exhibited quite as much in public as in private life snobbism is not confined to the toadying of the rich but is quite as often displayed in the toadying of the poor formerly sycophacy showed itself in not daring to speak the truth to those in high places but in these days it rather shows itself in not daring to speak the truth to those in low places now that the masses exercise political power there is a growing tendency to fawn upon them to flatter them and to speak nothing but smooth words to them they are credited with virtues which they themselves know they do not possess the public enunciation of wholesome because disagreeable truths is avoided and to win their favor sympathy is often pretended for views the caring of which in, pra in practice is known to be hopeless it is not the man of the noblest character the highest culture and best conditioned man whose favor is now sought so much as that of the lowest man the least cultured and worst conditioned man because his vote is usually that of the majority even men of rank wealth and education are seen prostrating themselves before the ignorant whose votes are thus to be got they are ready to be unprincipled and unjust rather than unpopular it is so much easier for some men to stoop to bow and to flatter than to be manly resolute and magnanimous and to yield to prejudices than run counter to them it requires strength and courage to swim against the stream while any dead fish can float with it this servile pandering to popularity has been rapidly on the increase of late years and its tendency has been to lower and degrade the character of public men consciences have become more elastic there is now one opinion for the chamber and another for the platform prejudices are pandered to in public which in private are despised pretended conversions which invariably jump with party interests are more sudden and even hypocrisy now appears to be scarcely thought discreditable the same moral cowardice extends downwards as well as upwards the action and reaction are equal hypocrisy and time serving above are accompanied by hypocrisy and time serving below where men of high standing have not the courage of their opinions what is to be expected from men of low standing they will only follow such examples as are set before them they too will skulk and dodge and prevaricate be ready to speak one way and act another just like their betters give them but a sealed box or some hole and corner to hide their act in and they will then enjoy their liberty popularity as one in these days is by no means a presumption in a man's favor but is quite as often a presumption against him no man says the russian proverb can rise to honor who is cursed with a stiff backbone but the backbone of the popularity hunter is of gristle and he has no difficulty in stooping and bending himself in any direction to catch the breath of popular applause where popularity is won by fawning upon the people by withholding the truth from them by writing and speaking down to the lowest tastes and still worse by appeals to class hatred such a popularity must be simply contemptible in the sight of all honest men jeremy bentham speaking of a well-known public character said his creed of politics results less from love of the many than from hatred of the few it is too much under the influence of selfish and dissocial affection to how many men in our own day might not the same description apply men of sterling character have the courage to speak the truth even when it is unpopular it was said of colonel hutchinson by his wife that he never sought after popular applause or prided himself on it he more delighted to do well than to be praised and never set vulgar commendations at such a rate as to act contrary to his own conscience or reason for the obtaining them nor would he forbear a good action which he was bound to though all the world disliked it for he ever looked on things as they were in themselves not through the dim spectacles of vulgar estimation popularity is the lowest and most common sense said sir john packington 
on a recent occasion is not worth the having do your duty to the best of your power win the approbation of your own conscience and popularity in its best and highest sense is sure to follow when richard lovell edgeworth towards the close of his life became very popular in his neighborhood he said one day to his daughter maria i am growing dreadfully popular i shall be good for nothing soon a man cannot be good for anything who is very popular probably he had in his mind at that time the gospel curse of the popular man woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you for so did their fathers to the false prophets End of section 17.